Thanks, Andrew. So before we get started, just a quick uh, note about the agenda. So the primary focus today is going to be on demoing the new features in our winter 2014 release. As such, this presentation will be somewhat more advanced than our previous webinar uh, in, in that it'll assume a basic understanding of the BigML workflow. After the demo, we'll recap the new features as well as mention a few additional features that we didn't demo directly. And, and then, of course, as Andrew mentioned, we'll have time for questions at the end. All right, so in order to demo some of BigML's new features, we'll need a data set to analyze. We'll be using loan data from Prosper.com. So what is Prosper? Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending site, meaning that investors directly fund personal loans to other individuals for a profit. The problem, of course, is that as an investor, you're now faced with performing the duties of an underwriter, trying to determine the risk of each loan to minimize the possibility of default. You could rely solely on traditional metrics like the credit rating, but Prosper makes a wealth of information available for download, which might be more insightful. You can actually see some of these collections that they provide and the data that's in them. Fortunately, finding patterns in data with many variables is easy with BigML. Now, before I get started on this demo, let me add a disclaimer. Please do not take anything in this presentation as an investment advice. I'm using the loan data from Prosper solely as a demonstration of BigML, and it is not meant to be useful as anything else. Also, a quick note about the data preparation in case anyone is interested in repeating this. I actually wrote a script which downloads the data from Prosper in a daily differential in an XML and accumulates those changes in a Mongo database. Uh, I then selected only listings created after January 1st, 2012 and joined the member group and loan data for each listing using the keys in each collection and then built a denormalized CSV which I've already uploaded to BigML. And in the interest of expediency, I've also already created the data set. So we're going to go straight into the data set now. And I'd like to just kind of walk you through a couple of the features that are in here. So first we have the listing number. And this, is, this allows us to refer to an individual loan on the Prosper site. And we'll come back to that when we do a batch prediction towards the end. Then we also have uh, a text field. This is actually the member description. So uh, each member can provide information about themselves. They also can provide endorsements or can receive endorsements, I should say. We have some numeric fields like number of friends. We also have members can belong to a group, so we have information about the group they belong to, including the name, description, uh, and a group rating, which is a, you'll notice is a categorical field, one star, five star, et cetera. We also have a categorical field, and we can see the vast majority of these loans are for debt consolidation, but there are a few others, uh, home improvement, business, household expenses, et cetera. There's a description field. This this one we'll, we'll see again, so I'm actually going to pull up the tag cloud. We can get kind of a nice visual overview of the tokens that are occurring in that text field. So we can see lots of things about credit and income. And if we scroll down, there's also a title, which is the title of the loan. And then we have these two listing, or the two status fields. And we're, we're going to focus on these for a couple of minutes. So we have the listing status and the loan status. And just a quick look at what some of the values are in here. We see the listing status is one of completed, canceled, withdrawn, expired, pending completion, or active. And then we also have this loan status of current, paid, charge off, a couple of different types of being late, uh, a few different types of defaulted. There's a defaulted bankruptcy, paid in full, settled in full. And to understand what these two status field mean, let's take a, just a quick sidetrack and have a look at the Prosper loan life cycle. So when a member creates a listing, that is they, they want a loan, they create a listing, and that listing immediately goes into an active state. And this allows investors on Prosper to bid on that loan. At the end of the bidding window, the loan can be in one of two states. It can either be withdrawn, expired, or canceled. That is the loan is no, or the listing, I'm sorry, has not progressed to become a loan or the listing can progress to completed, meaning that it received enough bids to become funded, at which point that listing then becomes a loan 
And the loan then has a status of how well the payments are being made, so they're either current or late. And eventually that loan can achieve a final disposition of one of the fields of paid, charged off, or any one of the three types of default. So what can we do with this data? Well, we actually could do quite a few things. Uh, one that I've done in the past before is using the loans that are inactive and building a model that predicts what the interest rate will be. It's kind of interesting to see when a listing first hits Prosper to try to predict what the interest rate is that it'll close at. But another thing we could do is we could take all the stuff that's in blue over here. These are listings that became loans and then attained some final disposition. And we could build a model that based on the data from the listing for those loans predicts what the final disposition would be. That is, we could now take all the things that are in green, which are current listings, and score them against that model to predict what their final disposition will be. And that's, that's what we're going to try to do today. So you can see there's a bit of a problem in that we want to find, we want to, we've got all of our listings are kind of mixed together, right? We've got, we need to separate out the things that are the open loans from the closed loans, from the ones that are, have a final disposition and the ones that are still active, and yet they're all mixed together. So how are we going to, to break these apart? This, of course, brings us to one of our new features, which is called dataset filtering. And what we can do is we can actually filter on that loan status field, which is a categorical, and it gives us these four possible values. So equals, doesn't equal, has a value, or has no value. And we can just put in what the final dispositions are. So in this case, we want paid, charge off, or any one of the three possible defaulted states. And we can call this the prosper closed. And what this new data set will represent is all of the listings that became loans and then attained one of these final disposition states. Now we don't have to wait for that to finish. We can actually come back in and start a second filter. This time we'll also filter on loan status. But now we want does not equal because we want to exclude all those listings that do not have a final disposition. And of course, this won't be quite enough. Just to hover over here, you can see what's left are things the, that have a loan status either of current, one month late, or any, you know, any of these late statuses. This isn't quite enough because we also want to extract listings that never became loans. So we can add a second filter, and we'll and, and we'll take the listing status. Is any one of active, completed, or pending completion. And we'll call this Prosper Open to represent all the loans that are that are still open that haven't attained a final disposition. And if we come back to our data set that has the closed listings in it, and just to verify that this worked, if we come down to the listing status, we can see the listing status is now only completed. Because in order, for a, in order for it to have become a loan and attained a final disposition, the listing would have had to have been completed. So this makes sense. And the loan status is only the five categories that we wanted. So that's perfect. Now, there actually are other types of filters. I just, I'm going to show you real quick some of the other options. Uh, if you choose a numeric to filter by, then you can actually filter by ranges of values. And you can also filter by percentiles. So if you wanted to remove outliers in a numeric field, you can do that very easily this way. You can also filter on text fields. So for example, the description is a text field. We can filter by whether or not this text field contains a keyword, case insensitive or not. And you can even filter by date time. So here we could actually come in and if we want to take a subset of this data set based on a time range, we could put in a filter rule for that as well. And if, obviously, you can combine these multiple multiple steps. All right, so let's come back to the closed model and or the closed data set and build our model. So we can start trying to gain some insights from it. And I'm going to take the defaults, but I'm going to remove the listing number from the modeling process. And you may have noticed. Uh, as I was scrolling through that data set, that there were some of the fields had exclamation marks on them. 
that means that they're non-preferred fields. And generally what this means is that the, uh, the data set algorithm has determined that they are unlikely to have any predictive power. And you can kind of see why just looking at the histogram, uh, these fields, for example, only have one value. And so they're marked as non-preferred. They'll be automatically ignored in the modeling process. So I didn't, that's why I didn't deselect them manually. And so let's just take a quick exploration of this tree that we now have. So the feature that was selected from the data set to uh, provide the most information gain for building this model turns out to be the borrower rate. And if we look at the right branch here, we have a split on a value of 20%. So the right-hand side is less than 20%, and the left-hand side is greater than 20%. And the borrower rate, I forgot to tell you, is the actual uh, rate the loan. Uh, when a loan becomes created, that's the interest rate of the loan. And so we can take a look at a couple of these final branches. Here we have an example of borrower rate less than 20. Term is less than or equal to two years. The title contains the token consolidation. And at least one payment has been billed. And this model is predicting that that loan would have a final status of paid with a confidence of 94%. So of course, we can also filter this to see different outcomes. So if we want to see the loans that are predicted to default in bankruptcy, we can do that. And here we have borrow rate greater than 20, uh, actually, in fact, greater than 24, debt to income ratio greater than 31, it contains credit more than once, and we're predicting default uh, in bankruptcy. If we take a quick look at the model summary, this will show us the field importance. And this is a normalized ranking of all the features, uh, how much they contribute to reducing the error in the model. And I just want to call out the top three here. We have the debt to income ratio is contributing on a normalized uh, fashion almost 36% of the error reduction, followed by a count of the number of payments that are less than one month late, and uh, also by a count of on-time prosper payments. And we're going to do this modeling process a couple different times, and that this top three sort of changes, uh, so that'll be interesting to compare. Also notice that the the credit score ranged lower, which is a lower range of their credit score, didn't contribute very much at all, which is interesting because that's a, a traditional metric to use. But let's switch over to our sunburst view so we can get an idea of how this model is performing overall. So this first view is colored by confidence. And we can see right away that this left-hand side is bright green. That means it's a bit more confident. And these are all the splits where the borrow rate is less than 20, whereas the right-hand side is typically a little more red. Um, this would be the borrow rate greater than 20. And we can actually see this is the same node we saw before, borrow rate less than 20, term less than 2, title contains consolidation, predicting paid. What's more revealing, however, is to color this model by the predicted outcome. Now remember, we have five possible outcomes for this model. There's paid, charge off, and any one of these three defaults. Uh, the bankruptcy in orange, the paid in full, and sort of that salmon color, and defaulted settled in full in green. And if we look at the, the view, the sunburst view, we don't see any of these default states represented in this model. We see this model is largely predicting paid for everything. Uh, and there's a few cases over here where it's predicting charge off but we see virtually no nodes that are predicting defaulted. And this, this seems worrying to us, or could seem worrying, because we want a model that, I mean, we're very interested in these default states, right? I mean, those are, those are sort of the risk. We'd like, to, we'd like to know that our model is picking them out. And just looking at this view, <clears throat> we get a feeling that maybe it's not doing a very good job of identifying those cases. So why is this happening? Well, if we go back to our data set, and if we just take a look at the distribution of the classes in the loan status, we can start to get an idea of what the problem might be. Our data set, our training set, has 6,462 instances of paid, 2,000 of charge off, and these default states are very, very small. There's only 205 instances that uh, in the data set where the uh, default was a bankruptcy, only 21 were as default paid in full, and only 13 were as settled in full. So why is this a problem? Or I should say, how do how can we solve this? So one way to solve this is uh, is to wait. So let's look at why you might want to wait the classes in your training set. So to do that, we'll we'll talk a little bit about how the training algorithm works. Let's assume that the modeling process is going through our data set, and it finds an instance that has these input features, a rate of 23% and a payment of 134. 
and the final outcome was paid. Given this one training example, the model might predict paid, or would predict paid, but it would have a low confidence because it doesn't have very many examples of that. As we add more instances that match those same input features and the same outcome, the confidence of the model would increase. You can imagine if we had a thousand such instances, we would still have the same predicted outcome, but now the confidence might be very, very high. After all, it's got a thousand instances with the same input features and the same result. So the question is, what happens if we just add one more instance that doesn't match the outcome? So it's got the same input features, but this time the status is default. Well, the model isn't going to change the, the predicted outcome because it only has one instance versus a thousand, but it would reduce the confidence slightly. And the problem with reducing the confidence slightly is that when you're looking at that 99.4% confident, you get a sense that you know, there's, there's no risk of default. And what's hiding here, or I should say what the problem is, is that the default is more important to us, but occurs less often than paid. Our, our intuition is that that one case of default is more important than the thousand times that it was paid. So there's a couple of different ways to, to achieve the weighting in the, learning, in the big ML learning algorithm. One is to directly specify objective weights. So for each class in your objective, you can specify a relative weight. So in this case, this field would be twice as important as these other two. You can actually specify a weight field. So each instance in your data set can have an integer that, that specifies how much to weight that instance additionally. Or you can also just use a very simple one, which is called balance objective. And this will balance the classes proportionally to the category counts, which is what we're going to do right now. But let me show you in the interface what this looks like. So if we go back into our configure model, we can see right here, oh, no, this is right. It's right here, the balance. Of, so this is the weight field. If we had a feature in our data set that we wanted to weight by, we could actually select it here. And if we also want to just do the balancing of the objective, we can select that right there. And we'll go ahead and call this Prosper Listings Balanced. So what do we expect? This time, when we switch over to the sunburst view, we expect to see those underrepresented classes in the data set. Uh, we expect to see them represented in the model more. So we're right. If we come back in and look at loan status again, Remember, essentially what we're doing is we're telling the modeling process to multiply these, these smaller classes, so that these all these objective fields have about the same occurrence. All right, so we can already see just from the tree view that this looks significantly different. And in fact, if we look at the model summary report and look at the field importance again, we can see that it's completely changed. The borrower rate and, and, in fact, actually the description, which is the, the raw text describing the nature of the, the listing. Uh, oh, oh, and I forgot to take off the listing number. That's what I forgot to do. <laughs> the, the listing number is a, is a bit of a red herring. Um, I can explain more about that later. But actually, let's just continue. I'll show you the sunburst. And if we color this by a predicted outcome. Uh, no, this is going to throw everything off. Okay, sorry. One more time through. Balance objectives. Forgot to take out the listing number. We did still at least get a. Um, oh, I even did the wrong one. Oof. All right. So switching to the sunburst view color this by the predicted outcome. And I just kind of want to explore this tree a little bit. Um, so first, just looking at it, you can see it looks totally different, right? And we've got much more representation of the defaulted states now. We can see here there's a nice big arc that is uh, predicting a default bankruptcy. We've got lots of cases of paid in full, some settled in full. And th there's a few additional, um, you know, we can like, we can zoom in over here and see what what's going on here. Because this is, uh, this is actually part of this tree that 
that uh, I found interesting at least. So here we have these two cases are a borrower rate is higher than 28 percent. Now we've got it's not an auto loan. The prosper score was greater than three, which is this integer value from about one to ten, I think. And in this green arc here, we have a debt to income ratio of greater than 0.27, and in the orange arc, we have less than 0.27. And what you'll notice is that when the debt to income ratio is high, the loan, the this group is being predicted as settled in full on a default, whereas this group over here is being predicted on bankruptcy. And this, when I first saw this, it seemed counterintuitive to me. You know, why why is the lower debt to income ratio uh, you know, predicting a bankruptcy, whereas the higher debt to income ratio is predicting a default settled in full. And this, this puzzled me enough that I actually asked a bankruptcy attorney what they thought about this. And they offered the uh, possibility that this group are people that have already filed for bankruptcy uh, in the past and have gotten themselves into trouble again. And because you can only file once every seven years, they missed, they got, they missed payments, the loan went into defaulted state, but they couldn't discharge it in bankruptcy so they eventually ended up paying off the loan anyways, uh, whereas this group over here was eligible for bankruptcy and discharged the loan that way. But the important thing to note is that this is, this is a pattern in this model that we did not see before because we had so many samples where the loan was paid that we were basically hiding this, this information. Uh, there's another one over here which is sort of interesting to look at. Here we have a prediction of defaulted bankruptcy, and right next to it we have a prediction of paid. And if we just highlight between these, you, you can see the only different thing that's changing in the upper right hand there, side there is the borrower rate. And this, this one sort of matches our intuition. If we have a low interest rate on our loan, we're predicting paid, whereas if the interest rate is higher, bounded in between uh, uh, 18 and 28 percent, then we're predicting bankruptcy. And that, that, that feels like it matches our intuition. All right, so you can ask, you know, does this make any sense? You know, aren't, aren't we cheating? And, and of course, the, the answer is, what we're doing is we're just telling the modeling process to treat those underrepresented classes as more important, to give them more weight in deciding what the final outcome is. And in this case, that's exactly what we want to do because we want to find all of these edge cases. I mean, we want, if we're going to predict paid, we want the model to be as pessimistic about loans that are going to be as paid as possible. And we didn't give it enough samples of these other states. And so the way to adjust for that is to tell is to basically tell the learning algorithm to be more aggressive in accounting for these lower class uh, lower counts in these classes. All right. So one thing that is interesting to note in again looking at the model summary is that uh, in, in this model and in the previous model the amount requested never really factored in, right? It wasn't it wasn't a factor. You can see in this one it's only a 0.03% field importance. And, and that, that seems sort of strange. I mean, you would sort of expect that there might be some kind of a correlation between the amount that somebody's asking for a loan and whether or not it gets paid off. Um, and of course, we could liken this to perhaps like a BMI measurement. We don't really expect your weight or your height to correspond directly to whether or not you have diabetes. But if you take those two fields and put them together, suddenly you get a metric, the BMI score, which does correlate pretty well to incidences of diabetes. And so we might imagine that if we combined amount requested with, say, the debt to income ratio, that we would end up with a new metric that correlates in our model better. So how would we do that? Well, this brings us to another new feature we have, which is adding fields to data sets. And there's actually quite a few different ways you can do this. But the, the overall is, for example, I could call a new field. We could call it relative risk. No space. And there's different ways that we, that we can uh, create this new field. One is we could normalize an existing field. Uh, we can also compute a z-score. There's a few other additional uh, built-ins, like logarithms. You can also do a mean. Uh, this is also a nice way to handle missing values. So if you have, you know, maybe you have, the a you have a field that's age, but in a lot of the instances it's missing the age, then you could just add the mean for, you could create a new field that has the if the age is there, it includes it. If it isn't, then it just puts the mean for all the rest of the ages in it. You can also do population, which gives you counts. You can also do random. And then there's this, this full-on JSON expression, which is the one we're going to do right now. And this basically allows you to do, in a Lisp-like language, programmatic field types. So we can come in and create an expression. Hopefully we can create and all I'm going to do is that that first operator there it means we're going to multiply. So we're going to multiply 
the amount requested by the debt to income ratio. So I'm basically making a new metric now that is basically uh, if um, if they're asking for more and their their income is low, this value will be higher. Uh, if they're asking for less and their income is high, this value will be very low. So it feels like it'll be a little more proportional because it includes their debt and their income and the amount they're asking for as well. Okay, and we can actually, you could of course create multiple new fields all at the same time, but we're just going to do this one. Oh, I spelled it wrong. That's what happens when you do it live. Sorry, guys. No spelling mistakes. Debt to income ratio. Uh, in case you guys missed it, the first time I had debt to income ratio, I had just had an extra end on the field name. We did get a nice error that told us what I did wrong at least. Uh, if we now look at this new data set and we go all the way down to the end, we'll see that we have this new feature called relative risk. And it's ranging from a value, well, it's, the data set's still computing, but right now we have values from 25 all the way up to 100,000. And of course, we could create an additional feature if we want to normalize this field. And if we want, we can also create a model off of that. And I'm just going to kick this one off and we can come back and look at it later. So we'll predict loan status, take this out, and risk. All right. So while. While that's running, let me come back and talk just very briefly about how the trees are grown because the next feature that we're going to talk about is a way to uh, control how the trees are grown in the learning algorithm. So how do, you know, where do these final nodes come from, right? If we look at um, this first model that we built, it had this node way up here, you know, whereas the rest of the tree is, it goes much deeper. And basically what happens is that at each split, what the learning algorithm is doing, is making a determination as to whether or not adding additional features will statistically change the outcome of the model. And if it isn't, then it basically prunes this node at this point, stops growing. Uh, whereas other branches, if there's you know, a statistical significance, then it'll continue growing. So, and that, when you look at the data set, and you configure the model, that's actually this statistical pruning option right here. The default is something that we call smart pruning. And what I just described is the active statistical pruning. And you can turn this off as well. You can say, never use statistical pruning. Just keep growing as much as you can. Um, why would you ever do that? The, uh, if you have a very small data set, then remember, you won't have as many instances uh, of each type um, of outcome. And so the confidences will be very low. And you can end up building a tree that only has, for example, one node. Uh, and the smart pruning tries to balance between these two. So if you have a small data set, it'll turn off pruning if it thinks that it's going to give you one node, for example. So an, an additional feature that you can use to control how the tree is grown is, is this node threshold, where you can see the default right now is 256. And if we just go ahead and uh, balance the objective again, uh, and I'll do, the best way to demonstrate is just to do it. So we'll do a node 3 and take the listing number out again. And so what's going to happen is basically the tree won't be allowed to grow past um, three nodes. And what we get is this almost uh, you know, ridiculously constrained model. And um, so why would you ever want to do this? Well, the, uh, we've actually had cases where um, you, know, you have a data set that has a lot of variability, many, many features. But it turns out only one feature is, you know, is, is very, very dominant. And by reducing the number of nodes, you're sort of forcing the learning algorithm to not consider all those other features that are really potentially not contributing much, which helps with how well the model can generalize to new instances that it didn't see during the training process. 
Um, so just for comparison, if we look at what this looks like with the upper end, we can actually set this to 2,000 nodes. Take out the listing number again. We can actually look at this one. Also notice that the support, which is literally a count of the instances, there are no nodes that have less than 11% support because we've essentially forced the model to prune away all of the, you know, the much um, smaller represented instances in the data set. Uh, whereas if we come to this 2000 node model, you can see it's much more complex and the support goes all the way down to 0.1%. In fact, even if we just filter in on a range of 0.1 to 1%, you can see there's still a very complex tree here. All right, so of course all of these features that we've been talking about uh, work with ensembles as well. So we're gonna go ahead and kick off an ensemble. And I'll come back into the closed data set. We'll configure an ensemble, predicting loan status. We're gonna choose bagging with 10 models. We'll balance the objective and take out the listing number. So while this is building, let me give you just a brief overview of what an ensemble is and why we why would ever use one. So the idea is rather than build a single model, we're going to build, in this case, 10 models. Um, you can actually build all the way up to 1,000 using the BigML interface. And the idea is each model is built with only a random subset of the data set. In fact, in this case, uh, we're using a random, or we're using something that's called replacement. So we sample an instance out of the data set and we put it back, which means it can be sampled again, which means it's statistically unlikely that any one model will sample all of the data in the data set. And so essentially each model has a random subset. And what this does is it reduces the impact of outliers in the, the um, learning algorithm, which of course improves the ability of the model to generalize to new data. All right, so how do you make predictions with an ensemble? We can come into the UI here and we can ask it for just a, a prediction with the defaults. And what we're gonna see is that each model is going to make a prediction. So here we have this first model is predicting for that input data a default of bankruptcy. And yet we have uh, two, four, six that are predicting paid, one that's predicting charge off and another bankruptcy and is settled in full. And you can see each one of these predictions has its own unique confidence level as well. And so the final prediction is, uh, is created by combining these predictions. And there's a couple of different ways to control how the combining is done. The default is something called plurality, which is just like a traditional voting. So majority wins, in this case that would be paid. So we see the final prediction up top here is paid. We can also change this to confidence weighting, which is similar, but now when we do the vote, we actually give additional weight to each one of these votes based on the confidence of the prediction. You can also do probability weighted, which is very similar to the voting algorithm, but now we're gonna uh, weight each vote by the uh, distribution of the classes at each node in that tree. And we have this new feature, which is called the class K threshold. And what this does is it allows you to constrain a prediction to require a certain number of models to vote a certain way. For example, I could say, I only want this, this ensemble to predict paid if nine models predict paid. And of course, in this case, we don't. We only have six that are predicted paid, so we end up predicting default bankruptcy, which is the second most likely outcome. Of course, we can do this the other way around, and we can say, I want it to predict charge off if only if only one model says it's charge off, then the outcome I want to be labeled as charge off. And in this case, we have exactly one model predicting charge off. And so we've constrained it now. All right, so we can use this model to score all of our instances in our open data set. Uh, before we do that though, notice that the, um, the data set, the, remember, Going on, rewinding all the way back, the Prosper Open, these are all the loans that are, don't have a final disposition. These are the ones that we want to score within our ensemble now and see, uh, and try to create a prediction of what their final disposition will be. And you'll notice that there's nearly 50,000 instances in here. Our ensemble has 10 trees in it, which means we're going to do about a half a million predictions. And even if we do thousands per second, that'll take a couple of minutes, which is a little longer than uh, we want to wait for in the webinar. So wouldn't it be great if we could just, for experimentation purposes, take a smaller selection of this data set. And that brings us to a, a new feature we have, which is called sampling. And I can, I can now come in and control 
how much of this data set I want to sample, so I can just take a 10% sample. There are also some additional advanced sampling. Right now, the default is to sample over the entire range. You can actually say, I want the sample to come from the first half or the later half of the data set. In this case, we'll take 10% over the whole range. You can also control whether it's a random sample or deterministic. And deterministic is important you know, for repeatability, which is uh, particularly important when you want to control the out-of-bag parameter. What the out-of-bag parameter does is allow you to create data sets that are samples that are uh, complementary. So in this case, you can see with a 10% rate out-of-bag no, we have nearly 5,000 instances. That's the 10%. But if I set out-of-bag yes, we have 40,000. That's the complement, so it's the other 90%. And of course, we can also control whether we want to uh, sample only once or sample with replacement as well. But for this, since we just want to do um, a nice sample for scoring, we'll take 10% random replacement no. Let's go ahead and let that run. So other, this is a, you know, this is typically, um, this is a pretty typical case for when you would do sampling. You might be working with a data set that's very large, and you want to do some rapid experimentation, try different modeling parameters, play with different size ensembles, and do evaluations. And it might be easier in, in terms of you know uh, the speed of iteration to start with a smaller sample. So you can take a nice little 10% or 20% sample and experiment with it, and then come back and use the full data set when you've got a better idea of what you want to do. So let's go ahead and score this sample, the sampled open with our ensemble. And if we come into the ensemble again, we can actually choose another new feature here called batch prediction. And what we have on the left-hand side here is you can choose the model or ensemble that you want to use for scoring. And on the right-hand side, all we need to do is give it the name of the data set that we want to use for scoring. We can control some of the um, how the predictions are made. So again, here we see our the way that we're going to do the voting. In this case, let's go ahead and do a K threshold. And let's say we're only going to predict paid if nine models agree. We can also control the output settings. So you can see in this preview right now, the only thing we're showing is the, the prediction. And we can add a header row. So now we, we'll get the first line of our output. will have uh, an indication of what these columns are. We can add the confidence. And we can even add features from the data set as well. So we can put the listing number in as well so that we can correlate this back to actual listings on the Prosper site. And now when we hit predict, What's going to happen is we're going to take the, that data set for every instance in there. We're going to run it through the ensemble, create a prediction, and we're going to accumulate all of those predictions in a in a CSV. Uh, accumulate all those predictions and then provide a CSV, which you can download. And if we take a look at this file. It's loading very slowly. Sorry about that. Now we can actually go ahead and sort this on confidence. Confidence. We'll go largest to smallest. And here we have now a listing where these these sort of top predictions of paid outcome are are ones that remember what we've done is we've built an ensemble. Um, we've balanced the objectives, so we're a bit more uh, pessimistic about what we predict is paid. And we've even set a K threshold. So we're only going to call it paid if nine out of 10 of the models in our ensemble agree. So this, this sort of a, gives us a you know, really quick and easy or a, a more confidence of these, um, of these predictions. All right. So a new feature recap, what I've shown you so far. We saw right at the beginning, we saw the data set filtering where I actually took this data set that had mixed instances and split it out into two new ones. Uh, we also talked about the fact that you can use that to filter out outliers using percentiles or, or just straight min and mean. You can even use data set filtering. Um, uh, well, that's. <laughs> and then, of course, we looked at the weights, which is a, a nice way to um, represent important classes that you don't have as many samples of in your data set. We took a look at the new feature where you can add data set fields. So now you can replace missing values. You can create new fields based on some built-in functions, and you can even provide your own complicated functions that combine data um, from other features in your data set. You can actually do that in columns as well. Uh, we looked at the node threshold, which allows you to control how complicated your tree is. We looked at the K threshold for ensemble predictions, which allows you to be more or to control the pessimism or 
how the votes are combined in your ensemble. We looked at data set sampling, which lets you take a smaller sample of a data set, either for experimentation or primarily for experimentation. And we also looked at batch predictions. So a couple of the features that we've added recently that I haven't mentioned so far is one, our development mode. Now the development mode has actually been there for a while, but we've made a few changes to it. First and foremost is that we've made it much more apparent. There's this little slider right here, which just allows you to easily switch between development mode and production. And we've also increased development mode so that any task up to 16 megabytes is free. There are a few limitations to development mode. Uh, the maximum number of models in ensemble can't be higher than 10. The maximum number of, in production, that can be 1,000. The number of terms in the text analysis is limited to 32. In production, that's 2,000. And the maximum number of nodes in a tree can't be higher than 512. In production, that's 2,000 as well. This is sort of a passive feature. We've introduced a new algorithm in our back end that we call mTree. This allows us to build our models completely in memory when they fit in memory. Previously, we did a streaming algorithm. We still have the streaming algorithm, but we only had it at the time, um, which of course allows us to build models that are much larger than the physical memory. But um, this, uh, this new mTree algorithm is nearly 10 times faster, and we've also added several tiers of machines with different sizes, so it's very unlikely that your task won't, be, won't fit in memory, so you'll get about a tenfold uh, increase in the modeling speed. This is a feature we didn't talk about yet, which is currently only available through the API, but multi-data sets allow you to combine data sets into a new data set. So you could imagine, for example, that maybe you're collecting data in batches and creating a new data set every day, and now you want to train a model over a week's worth of data. Uh, multi-data sets would let you take each of those daily data sets and combine them together into a new weekly data set, and then use that for your modeling. This also works with sampling. We've introduced a significant step forward in something that we call flatline, which is our, our move towards programmatic machine learning. So what is that? The idea here is that through our API, um, you, can, you can now interact with this cloud platform and using your own you know, programmatic, you can do programmatic machine learning. So some of the examples we saw were these complex filters you can do. Uh, and this is actually the add fields that we looked at is sort of like a flatline light. It's in the UI. What you can do through the API is, is quite a bit more advanced. Um, you can also, I, I sort of mentioned this in passing, but the uh, combinations you can do also you can do on columns. So you can actually apply a sliding window to your data and use that to handle time series data. So a little bit more about the programmatic ML. When we bring features to, to uh, the big ML platform, we always implement them in the back end first. Then we bring them to our API, and then finally our UI team uh, scrambles to try to integrate them. And what I, what I mean is that our API is uh, usually has m many more features than our UI. So there's quite a bit more you can do through our API. We use our API ourselves internally for our, for our own UI. And we're actually planning on doing a future webinar with a focus primarily on the API where we'll explore some of these more uh, advanced capabilities in, in, our, in this programmatic machine learning paradigm. All right, so as you can see, we are constantly innovating at BigML. The features that we discussed today have been implemented just since our last webinar in October, and we will continue to advance the science of easy-to-use machine learning. So as a thank you for joining this webinar and to make it even easier for you to get started, we're offering a 25% discount off our subscription plans, the code for which you can see here. Also, don't forget our free development mode. And finally, please don't hesitate to ask us questions through email or online campfire, of course, right now. Uh, but we monitor our, our email 24-7, and we're always happy to help out. And so with that, I'll yield back to Andrew to moderate the questions for the